up to you, to each of you. We welcome you to the Piedmont Park Seventh-day Adventist Church Online Sabbath School Lesson Study. I am Pat Barber, and with me and leading our discussion, as always, is Pastor Ray Daniel. Good morning, Pastor Ray. How are you? Good morning. Fine, thank you. Wonderful. I tell you, I love, love, love your scenery in the back there, all that beautiful <laughs> green and the water in the back and the pretty white sand. It's just uh, restores my soul <laughs> in a manner of speaking. Amen. <laughs> it does indeed. Well, friend, we, friends, we seem to be out of the grip of the uh, deep freeze that we were in. Now we're experiencing a lot of fog and so forth, but we are grateful that we can come together on God's holy day to discuss uh, his, his word and his uh, place of refuge for us. Uh, this lesson this week, I retitled it to uh, the God of relationships. And so I think that we're going to see that as we go through this. And the theme of peace and safety continues uh, to be weaved throughout this lesson as in previous lessons. But I don't want to take up a lot of time uh, summarizing the lesson and giving the forecast and all of those kinds of things. We really do want to spend the time uh, delving into his word with all the scriptures that we have. Pastor Ray, you do a great job of leading us through all of the various scriptures. So we really do appreciate that. Uh, you're welcome. So friends, let's bow our heads so that we can get into our study here very quickly and uh, ask the Lord to bless it for us. Dear Father in heaven, we are so grateful to you for giving us this opportunity and this chance to come before you to study, to open your word and to, to sit at the feet of Jesus, as it were, to uh, take in all that you have here for us. Uh, we thank you so much for being a protector, a defender, a deliverer, and a savior. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Dear Father, we ask that you would forgive us each of our sins. We ask that you would bless each person, each family that is uh, represented, uh, each family that is connecting to us. And along that line, we do remember all those names that are in our prayer box, and of course, all the names that did not make the prayer box. We continue to lift up to you uh, all every, each person that is there, and we ask blessings for the families and the caregivers and the ones that are supporting uh, those that are listed there. Amen. Dear Father, we ask you please to uh, bless this study. We pray that your Holy Spirit would touch our hearts, would help us to, um, uh, would convict our hearts, would help and motivate us, inspire us uh, to want to have the kind of relationship that it is so obvious through these scriptures that you are desirous of having with us. And we thank you for that. We are in awe of that. And we thank you for that. Dear Father, we ask that you would bless this technology here, that it would work well for us and uh, quiet the noise of the week so that we can concentrate on what you have for us. And we thank you so much again for being with us and for caring so much about us and to want to have a close, intimate relationship with us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. I turn it over to you. All right. Well, let's see what we can come up with here. And I see I've got a little remedial work to do, apparently. Okay. And let me check on that. All right. See what's going on. Yes. Okay. I'm going to go there. Do you see what I see? I only see you. You don't <laughs> see it. Okay. Well, Not yet. Let's go back here. Let's see. All right. Okay. Getting All right. closer. <laughs> All right. What's going on? Okay. I think I'm going to. All right. 
right, here we go. I think we're going to get there now. Okay. okay. There we are. There we are. Very there good. Thank we you. Are. <laughs> yes. Okay. Oh, um, Pastor, as you do that, I did. I see there. Cindy did send a message in there that says, "Please pray." I am still in the hospital. So, Cindy, yes, we are continuing to pray for you and asking those that are joining us to pray for you as well. So sorry, you're still there. All right, thank you. Well, um, as we see here, we're looking at lesson four. I, I apologize for having sent the wrong lesson out initially, folks. Uh, <laughs> So uh, my my email on Friday uh, has next week's lesson instead of this week. So I had to do a second mailing. Hope you got both of them and hang on to the other one for next week. But today we're going to be dealing with lesson four. The Lord hears and delivers. Well, a personal question to my partner here, Sister Pad. Who's the best listener, you or Brad? <laughs> well, I'm going to say Brad. <laughs> Although I try. <laughs> but, uh... <laughs> Has, have you ever heard the words, you're not listening? Not usually, but <laughs> I, I suppose I have. I can't remember uh -oh. it at this moment, but uh, yeah, I'm sure I have. <laughs> well, I, I hear those occasionally. Yeah, I'm sure I have. <laughs> usually attached to that is you need hearing aids. <laughs> <laughs> but it's more yeah. a matter of uh, sort of letting it go in one ear and out the other. But yeah. um Thankfully, uh, our Lord is not like that. The Lord no. hears. He hears. Mm -hmm. We're going to see that stress throughout this lesson. But he not only hears, he delivers. Yes. Memory text uh, assures us of that, that the righteous cry out, and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all their troubles. He certainly did that for many, many Bible characters, did he not? Indeed, he did. Yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, uh, I have a personal connection with one of them, the prophet Daniel. And uh, Daniel certainly was rescued when they threw him into that lion's den. And he cried out to the Lord. And Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace. A wonderful uh, examples of the Lord hearing and delivering and the righteous crying out. So again and again, the Psalms highlight the truth that the sovereign Lord who created and sustains the universe also reveals himself as a personal God, one that's just for us personally. And he initiates and sustains a relationship with his people and with us. So God is close to his people and to his creation, both in earth and in heaven. Yeah. Yeah. He says in Psalm 73, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. Whom have I in heaven? but you, and there is none upon earth that I desire besides, besides you. Yes. That's a beautiful description of the closeness of our relationship with this wonderful creator, God. Uh, mm -hmm. And um, though, um, though he has established his throne in heaven, though he rides on the clouds, he is also near. To all who call upon him, to all who call upon him in truth. So, in the one sense, he's way, way higher than we are. Mm -hmm. More high than we can imagine. Mm -hmm. And on the other side of the coin, he is near. That's right. What a wonderful thing to know. Yes. The and, he is the and he is the only one that can be far and near at the same time. Uh, at the same time. Yeah. 
So the Psalms unswervingly uphold the truth that the Lord is the living God who acts on behalf of those who call upon him. Uh, Psalm 55 was given as an example of that. And uh, the psalmist writes, I, I will call upon God and the Lord shall save me evening and morning and at noon I will pray and cry aloud. Uh, that was the pattern of Daniel. And uh, he went ahead and did it even when he knew that his life was in danger for doing so. Uh, I'm not as sure that we are as faithful to our worship as he was and as this text reveals. Uh, evening, morning, noon, praying and crying aloud, but it would be a good thing for us to do. And he says, he shall hear my voice. He's redeemed my soul in peace and so forth. Uh, yeah, so uh, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. So the Psalms are meaningful precisely because they're prompted by and are addressed to the living God who hears and answers prayers. And I love, uh, Pastor Ray, when we talk about God hearing, we're talking about he understands. It's not a matter of just he can hear the words spoken, the, the physical aspect or, or the physiological aspect of hearing, but that he hears, he understands, he he gets us, in other words. You know, he he has a full knowledge as we're going to discover through the study of this lesson. So when we talk about God hearing, uh, for anyone who's ever felt misunderstood or not understood or uh, or whatever, God is the source then, is that God is the one for just that individual. He's God for all of us, but particularly for someone who feels not understood because God understands us. Amen. Uh, he not only hears, but he understands. Yes. Um, why does he understand us so well? I think <laughs> that's explained here quite clearly in our Sunday portion, Psalm 139. Um, it's, a, it's a beautiful statement <clears throat> of how he understands and why. You search me and know me. You know my sitting down, my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. You comprehend my path and my lying down. You're acquainted with all my ways. There's not a word in my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. You've hedged me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's high. I cannot attain it. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Isn't this beautiful poetic language? <laughs> oh, very beautiful. <laughs> Very Even beautiful. there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. For you formed my inward parts. You covered mm. me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they all were written. The days fashioned for me when as yet there were none of them. How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God! How great is the sum of them! If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I am still with you. Well, uh, we're asked, how does this text poetically depict God's power, presence, and goodness? It shows that they are totally unlimited. They're vast. He knows everything about mm -hmm. us. So what does this great knowledge of God about us and all his promises uh, 
what, what does it say about those promises that they are sure That's he right. helps us and he is going to be faithful to whatever he's told us? That's right. Well, um, we were asked the question, did you ever want to help someone but had no means? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> yes. Some people tried to help you but didn't know what your needs were. But unlike the most loving and best intentioned people, God has both the perfect knowledge of us and our circumstances. And also, the good news is, he has the means to help us. Therefore, his promises of help and deliverance are not shallow platitudes, but firm assurances. Yeah. And we, and we know this to be true when we look at our own lives and the lives around us where we see God working. We see answers to prayer. We talked about this before where yeah. we said that, yes, we can certainly look at all of the, see God working because the, the Bible, one of the marvelous things about the Bible is that it gives us a view uh, of looking on. It's like looking at a television set, if you will, or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. We're looking on and we can see what the person in the story couldn't see. So we could see God's hand working and so forth. But then we also can relay some of those things to our own lives to where we don't have to go all the way back there, although it's wise to do so. Mm -hmm. We can look at our own lives to see how God is working right now for us and for those around us. Amen. So, Amen. yeah, it's a marvelous yeah. thing. Well, he sees God involved in his entire existence, and, and God's wonderful knowledge is the result of his creatorship, the fact that he made us, and, and close acquaintance with people, and is manifest in his care for them and for us. Um, and our lesson makes a good point. It says, uh, this intimate knowledge shouldn't scare us but should drive us into the arms of Jesus and what he's accomplished for us at the cross. Yes. He's done all that so that we can be saved. He has given us his righteousness, the righteousness of God. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, so God's presence is highlighted uh, as God is depicted reaching as far as hell or the grave and darkness. Uh, he can find us anywhere. Uh, places not typically depicted as where God dwells, but he is even there with us in our graves. His, his presence is also depicted as taking the wings of the morning uh, mm. to the east to reach the uttermost parts of the sea to the west. Uh, and these images convey the truth that there is no place in the universe where we can be out of God's reach. Nowhere. That's right. And what a, what a comforting, very, very, talking about giving security and peace and comfort, what a comforting thought to think that no matter where I am, he knows where I am and he, and he has said, I will never leave you or forsake you. So <laughs> whether it's in the lion's den, uh, even for us, metaphorically speaking, or, or for real, literally, or in the fiery furnace again yeah. literally or metaphorically speaking for us today that's right that's right we were directed to hebrews 1 and there we see the um, beautiful statement about the brightness of his glory that jesus had the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. So when Jesus came, he represented the Father. Yes. Exactly what the Father is like. And in every action, every way he treated people, we see the Father in him. Amen. And he Amen. went ahead and paid for our sins and has gone back now to the right hand of the majesty on high. So as the one who knows all about us, God is the one who can help and restore us. Well, our lesson said some might find the fact that God knows so much about them, even their darkest secrets, a rather frightening thought. 
why is the gospel then our only hope? Because it's <laughs> the only thing that can remove the fear. That's right. Yeah. Uh, That's right. And show us that his love is able to save. Well, and we, we have money. Yes. I was going to say, and we have so many examples mm. of uh, the depravity and the sinfulness of man, yet God still, it, it doesn't matter. The, the worst individual, God still loves. His love just uh, surpasses any of our human uh, natural carnal state of sinfulness oh, yeah. because he, he just, he loves us that much. He, he didn't love us because we he cleaned us up already and then he loved us. No, he loved us before, as David has pointed out here in Psalm 139, before we were even knit in our mother's womb, essentially, that uh, he already loved us. No matter the worst thing, the worst thoughts that I have, the worst things that I do, he still loves me. He's not loving what I'm doing, but he loves me. And I think that that is something to that is the gospel <laughs> that yeah. is the gospel yes. yes well uh we have assurance of this love through the care that he provides we looked at that on monday uh, we looked at a number of texts of how the lord has heard prayers and answered them some <clears throat> psalm 40 says i waited patiently for the lord and he inclined to me and he heard my cry. And it goes on to say what the Lord then did for him mm -hmm. and how he will trust in the Lord. Uh, Psalm 50, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you. <clears throat> we saw the one in Psalm 55, cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. Psalm 121, a beautiful passage about lifting up your eyes to the hills uh, some have misunderstood that to say that's idol mm -hmm. worship, that you're lifting up your eyes to the idols on the hilltops. No, that's not talking about that. It's mm -hmm. talking about the creator of those hills, the one who made heaven and earth. And he never slumbers or sleeps. He's always there to help us. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. So I used uh, to, I, I, Pastor, I used to wake up in the morning to, uh, my aunt was a huge, the, the aunt that I, that raised me was a huge gardener and she would be out gardening early in Florida. You, <laughs> my best friend, my good friend down there, rather, uh, also they're out gardening at four, four thirty five o'clock. As soon as it's light, they're out gardening and she oh. would be. And so, uh, and actually I do that here, not four thirty, but five, five thirty. I usually am out in the, in the summertime. Oh. But uh, this was one of the psalms that I would hear her, I would wake up hearing her recite, citing out in the yard. And, that, and it's one I have committed to memory as well. And I just love, love this psalm. It's, it's just, it's very short. You know, it's only eight verses. And, the, and it makes sense when you're, when you're reciting it. It just makes sense of how it just, how one verse just flows into the next verse. It does. And uh, yeah. And uh, it's just very, very beautiful talking about God as our help. So um, this passage shows how God is involved in our daily affairs. And it yes. just shows clearly that he's with us constantly. He's with us day and with us and night. night. Mm -hmm. So he reveals himself uh, in scripture as the living God who acts on behalf of those who call upon him. <clears throat> Psalm 16 says, the Lord is always before me. So I'm mm. going to trust him and I'm going to call upon him. The Lord will hear even when he cries out of the depths. And he says in 130, out of the depths I've cried to you. Lord, hear my voice. Conveying that no life circumstance escapes God's sovereign dominion. So the psalmist's cry, no matter how urgent, is never devoid of hope. Amen. Amen. It also celebrates the power of the creator in the faithful individual's life. Which includes, uh, as we saw in Psalm 121, he will not allow your foot to be moved. 
what did we discover? The image of the word foot uh, is often descriptive of. Well, the the author of our lesson says it's descriptive of one's life journey, yeah. life's journey. Uh, we also think of walking with the Lord and how yes. he walked with God. And right. So the, the feet give us that that mm -hmm. image of our walk in life. Right. And, and it makes um, us no, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, no, no. Go finish your thought. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no. Uh just a few more passages here that say the same thing in in essence, that that he guides our feet and our walk. Yes. Exactly. So what were you going to say? I was just going to say also, in addition to these, is in Psalms 23, uh, he leads me beside the still waters, or he leads me in the paths of righteousness that is leading towards him. And so there's a lot of, uh, I think what this kind of points out for us also is that there's so many supporting scriptures that uh, there are uh, so many scriptures that support, well, all of them do for the most part, there's other scriptures to support this scripture. And, you know, the mm -hmm. scriptures are very mm -hmm. intertwined, I guess. Yes, they and are. so, um, because when you're reading them, it always brings to mind other scriptures that mean the same thing. They do. Um, we're told here that the Hebrew word for move describes the security that God gives to the world. Uh, he, he established it so that it cannot be moved. And uh, it also refers to Zion. Uh, mm -hmm. Those who trust in the Lord are like Mount Zion, which cannot be moved. Mm -hmm. It's forever. Secondly, the image of the Lord is Israel's keeper who does not slumber nor sleep highlights his constant alertness and readiness to act on behalf of his children. And he says, I'll not allow your foot to be moved. It also talks about the Lord being our shade. He's your shade at your right hand. That's why you said the, uh, the Floridians do their gardening so early in the morning when there's <laughs> less sunshine. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Uh, and this is a passage Floridians should really love. The sun shall not strike you by day. <laughs> That's right. Uh, uh, this idea of shading calls to mind the pillar of cloud in the time of the Exodus uh, that the Lord gave them to lead them uh, to the promised land. Uh, a pillar of cloud uh, and by night a pillar of fire. So the Lord provides physical and spiritual shelter to his people. He is at our right hand. Uh, the right hand, our lesson uh, reminds us, typically designates a person's stronger hand, the hand mm -hmm. of action. And so it, it uh, refers to his right hand, his uh, mighty arm, Psalm 89. Uh, strong is your hand and high is your right hand. Yes. And then it conveys his nearness and favor by saying he's right there. He, he's right there at our right hand. Uh, you've heard the term right hand man? Yes. Right hand man. Yeah. That's yeah. someone that we uh, depend on to be yes. uh, right there by us and helping us out. It's great to have someone like that. And uh, hopefully uh, as couples, we are each other's right-hand person uh, mm -hmm. there to help one another. So he is there at uh, our right hand. And then God's protection is clearly confirmed in Psalm 21, uh, where it says that the sun is not going to strike us or the moon uh, by night, and he's going to preserve us. So God shall preserve his children from all evil. The bottom line, the psalmist trusted in God's loving care. Is that something we ought to do? Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. It sure is. And this lesson here helps us understand why we're able to do that. That's right. On Tuesday, uh, we looked at the Lord as a special refuge in adversity. Uh, Psalm 17 he said, do you save those who trust in you from those who rise up against them? 
So keep me as the apple of your eye. Hide me under the shadow of your wings from the wicked who oppress me, from my deadly enemies who surround me. And in 31, he says, Oh, Lord, I put my trust in you. Let me never be ashamed. Deliver me in your righteousness. Deliver me speedily. Be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. For you are my rock, my fortress, and so forth. Uh, Psalm 91, the same thing. He is my refuge and my fortress. Now, in the case of David, uh, that's exactly where he would hide uh, to uh, <laughs> preserve his life from his enemies. That's uh, <laughs> this was a literal thing. He was there mm -hmm. in the mountains, in these caves, uh, in these places of refuge, and he trusted God to protect him there. Um, so what does the psalmist do in times of trouble? He places his trust in God and appeals to him for protection and deliverance. And deliverance, yes. So it shows us that uh, just because we do love God and we trust God and we believe he is our protector, uh, that does not mean we will have no problems. Uh, we're going to have a lot of difficult situations yes. in our lives. But uh, no matter what the circumstance, the right approach for us is to trust him. Or if trust doesn't work in adversity, then it will not work anywhere. That's true. Yeah. That's right. That's right. So he continues to trust in the God of his who is his refuge and fortress. He calls God the Most High and the Almighty. And he trusts in his power. He knows that he has all the power he needs to protect him. And so he says, he who dwells in the secret place of the Most High, abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, he's my refuge and fortress, my God. In him, I will yeah, trust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hope we'll all think that way and and say those kinds of things in our own lives day by day mm -hmm. uh, because it's true and we can depend upon it. Amen. The psalmist Amen. tells of the security that no one, that one can, not no one, but the, that, that one can find in God, this secret place, this shelter, hiding place. Uh, the shadow of his wings and so forth. Mm -hmm. uh, we see also the terms refuge and fortress and wings and shield and buckler and dwelling place. Uh, all of these different descriptions of how he protects us. And Psalm 91 says, because you have made the Lord who is my refuge, even the most high, your dwelling place. Mm -hmm. That's how you can know that you will be safe. So these images uh, represent safe havens in the psalmist culture. Uh, the culture of his day. That's right. Um, yeah. But one of the most beautiful <laughs> descriptions of his protection is here in Matthew 23. Jesus speaking, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Here we have a beautiful picture of a, of a chicken protecting its little chicks. Mm -hmm. And it's saying that that's what God is like. His wings are spread over us. We are under the shadow of his wings, Psalm 17. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Psalm 57. My soul trusts in you and in the shadow of your wings, I will make refuge. Uh, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice, Psalm 63. This... This metaphor elicits comfort and assurance by implying the protection of a mother bird. The Lord is also compared to an eagle, another very powerful bird who, who guards its young with its wings. And he says, that's how I brought you out of Egypt. Uh, I, I bore you on an eagle's wings. And uh, in uh, Deuteronomy, as an eagle stirs up its nest and hovers over its young, spreading out its wings, taking them up, carrying them on its wings. 
I, I did that for you. I brought you out of Egypt. And then, of course, the one we just saw in Matthew, it's compared to a hen gathering her chicks under her wings. So um, I hope that in our lives daily, we have that sense that we are safely under his wings. Amen. Psalms 91 is another one I've committed to memory. And I and I uh, have gained so much uh, peace from reciting, uh, well, we get peace from several different verses, but I particularly do from this one yes. because it, uh, and as a matter of fact, I heard Mark Finley talk about this once and he did, he, he said that this is actually one of the Psalms that, uh, it, it's good to memorize this one because this is one that speaking, not only did it speak of David's time when he's hiding in the caves and all of the things that he's dealing with. And can you imagine treading upon the lion and the cobra? <laughs> That's very oh, scary uh, thoughts to me, yeah. you know, but then yeah. he also talks about how um, it also is one snare. The fowler is talking about the snares of Satan and, you know, and the perilous, Oh, uh, pestilence or in uh, another version, I think I kind of memorized it said noisome pestilence It's talking about the disease of sin. And it was just a real good explanation of some of, uh, you know, just expanding a little bit some of what was going on and what was happening with this particular psalm. But also this is the psalm. I mean, some of what is said here is uh, talking about where it's talking about no evil shall befall you, nor shall any plague come nigh thy dwelling. Is talking about in the time of trouble, you know. And so we can see where uh, these psalms were for the time that the author wrote them, and then how they were for times even before that. They weren't said so beautifully. David had a gift. Uh, right. As we know of uh, song and psalm prose, and he also, but it's also for us living in this time. And it, these are words that will carry us, those of us that are alive, through the end of time when um, it appears that we are alone. We won't be alone, right. but. Right. Uh, but these verses, you know, as we're memorizing these things and God's goodness and how he is a refuge and a fortress. Can you imagine going to the mountains and hiding there and so forth? Mm -hmm. I mean, I just but in our everyday lives right now, we can gain so much peace from knowing these things about God. Someone else is saying it, but we know that it's true because we've experienced it ourselves as well. Amen. Amen. Um so at the end of uh, Tuesday's portion, it says, uh, how do we deal with the times when calamity strikes and we can't seem to see the Lord's protection? Uh, why do these traumas not mean that the Lord is not there with us? It means that he's there with us more than ever. Yes. He doesn't yes. abandon us. Uh, and the more our need, the more he's there. He's our defender and deliverer, as we saw on Wednesday. Uh, in 1 Corinthians, uh, we're told that uh, the Apostle Paul wanted uh, everyone to know about what happened to the children of Israel, uh, that they uh, were under the cloud and they passed through the sea. Uh, they were baptized into Moses in the cloud in the sea and they ate the same spiritual food, drank the same spiritual drink because they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them. And that rock was Christ. Christ. Well, uh, Paul describes the Exodus story in an interesting way and, uh, and shares the spiritual lesson that uh, we need to understand from it, that being baptized and partaking of spiritual food and drink is what helped them through that experience and that we need the same mm -hmm. and that Christ is the rock that not only provided for them, but provides for us our mm -hmm. cleansing and our nourishment. Mm -hmm. um, 
a beautiful passage uh, describing just how that happened in uh, in their release from Egypt. Psalm 114. When Israel went out of Egypt, the house of Jacob from a people of strange language, Judah became his sanctuary and Israel his dominion. The sea saw it and fled. Jordan turned back. The mountains skipped like rams, the little hills like lambs. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what beautiful language. Yeah. yeah. So how is the divine deliverance of the people of Israel from Egypt poetically described? As nature being controlled by God. Yes. And he had control of the situation. Mm -hmm. All through the Old Testament and even in the New, the deliverance from Egypt was seen as a symbol of God's power to save his people. The sea, the river Jordan, the mountains and hills poetically represent the natural and human powers opposing the Israelites on their way to the promised land. And they had plenty of them as they were traveling toward the promised land. Um, but eventually they got down to the Jordan. Joshua was leading them. And he told them exactly what they were to do as they got there. And they did what they were told to do. Uh, the priest took up the ark and crossed over before the people. And, uh, and they were able to follow and to come across into the promised land. He said, by this you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will without fail drive out from before you the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Hivites and the Perizzites and the Girgashites and the Amorites and the Jebusites, all these sites. Yes. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, that's exactly what he did for them. Uh, mm -hmm. The priests bore the Ark of the Covenant, and they stood firm on dry ground in the midst of the Jordan, and all Israel crossed over on dry ground until all the people had crossed completely over the Jordan. So God is sovereign over all of these powers of man and nature, and... Uh, in fact, for many of God's children in all times and in all places, the way to the heavenly Jerusalem is fraught with danger, just as it is now. And the Psalms encourage them to look beyond the hills toward the creator of heaven and earth. Yes. That's where our help comes from. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So not looking at nature, not looking at the hill. Well, in this case, you're right. Absolutely. The uh, You've said that. But also understanding that worshiping nature is not the way to go either. That we are to worship the creator of nature. Lovely. The one who has total control over nature. Uh, and, you know, we've read the stories of the parting of the Red Sea and the parting of the Jordan so often that, uh, you know, you wonder if we truly, if we were to, if you were to stop and think about that. That was a pretty monumental miracle. Oh, unbelievable. Monumental miracle. And uh, not all those people could swim. You know, uh, not all those people. Uh, there was just a whole lot going on with these people. And to be led across on dry land um, through this these acts of obedience uh, is miraculous. It's miraculous. It is. Our lesson went on to um, connect Psalm 114, 1 to 8, the spirit of that, in terms of how God uh, is in control of nature. Uh, and it refers us to Jesus' uh, own ministry, the calming of the sea storm. Yes. His proclamation that the church has nothing to fear because he's overcome the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we don't have to worry. Uh, he is also in charge of those things uh, as as the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when he was on earth and still today. Um, he has that wonderful power over nature, just like uh, he had during the days of the children of Israel. So with God on our side, we have nothing to fear. Amen. <clears throat> 
Thursday, we see a connection between his power and his protection emanating from a certain source. And what is that, such Pat? What is that source we're going to look at here now? We're going to look at the sanctuary. The sanctuary. Yeah. The sanctuary. Mm -hmm. um, I cried to the Lord, and he heard me from his holy hill. Yeah. Um, so his place of residence was his tabernacle, his sanctuary that he established here on earth. And in Psalm 27, we find, uh, in the time of trouble, he shall hide me in his pavilion. In the mm -hmm. place of his tabernacle, he shall hide me. He shall set me high upon a rock. Psalm 61, I will abide in your tabernacle forever, and I will trust in the shelter of your wings. So where does help come from in these texts? It comes from God, from right. his sanctuary. And from the sanctuary. motif of spiritual and physical refuge and help notably appears in the context of the sanctuary. Mm -hmm. It's a place of help and safety and salvation. It's a shelter to the troubled. Uh, God defends orphans, widows, gives strength to his people from his sanctuary. And uh, Psalm 50 said, out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God will shine forth and his righteous judgments are proclaimed and, and his blessings go forth. Um, blessed are those who dwell in your house. They will still be praising you. Um, we uh, are especially uh, inspired by the wonderful story of, of Samuel and oh. how his mother led him to the Lord and 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 how he was able from a child to grow up in the sanctuary, in the tabernacle. Um, he must have had a, a huge amount of blessing because it says, blessed are those who dwell in your house. He did it literally. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. He did it like, literally. Yeah. And mm -hmm. uh, they will still be praising you. And he certainly did. Mm -hmm. uh, the Lord who made heaven and earth bless you from Zion. So the refuge in the sanctuary surpasses the security provided by any other place in the world because God personally dwells in the sanctuary. It's his presence. It's not just the building. No. That about. That's uh, right. And uh, it's not the fact that it's a mountain, but it's the mountain where he is, where the Lord dwells, Mount Zion, that yeah. makes it surpass other mountains, though in itself it's a modest hill. Uh, Mount Zion is, is nothing compared to many of the other mountains around, uh, but it's something special because that's where God chose to dwell. Uh, this is the mountain which God desires to dwell in. Yes, the Lord will dwell in it forever. The mountain of the Lord's house shall be established, and he shall be exalted above all, and, it, and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall float to it. And so there he is still today in that sanctuary, our Lord Jesus Christ. We do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but was in all points tempted as we are. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So the sanctuary is still our refuge, and uh, it's portrayed in the same way uh, as the psalmist portrayed it, as a place of refuge and help. Yes. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, Pastor Ray, as I was reading this, one of the, reading these uh, verses, one of the things that does kind of stand out is that they're pointing us away. They're taking our eyes off of the problem and off of the situation here and pointing us instead towards the sanctuary where God is, uh, towards the Lord is what it's what they seem to be doing. Is saying, take, you know, rather than focus, and I think that this author has shared that in a previous lesson as well, uh, uh -huh. not in so many words, but just the idea of rather than focusing on um, or being consumed by 
whatever the issue or problem or circumstance is, if we could just lift our eyes to the sanctu- to the sanctuary where we know God is. And then when we read the this verse here, then in Hebrews, then it's like, oh yes, yes, that is true. And so I think it's so good that we are have all these verses that talk about, you know, it's said in so many different ways, like Holy Hill, Zion, um, uh, pavilion, God's house, holy places, all of those depict uh, God's sanctuary where he is. Uh, and to think, you know, you can just kind of sort of visualize what well, he's given us a visual of the sanctuary that was here on earth. And so we can visualize that with Christ there ever interceding on our behalf. Amen. What a thought that is for us. Amen. Amen. Well, the holiness of God's sanctuary prompts the psalmist to acknowledge that all people are sinful and completely undeserving of God's favor. And he claims that deliverance is based on God's faithfulness and grace alone. Amen. Because nothing in us gives us any merit before God. It's only when people stand in a right relationship with God through repentance and acceptance of his grace and forgiveness that they can plead for his assurance of deliverance. And the sanctuary service represented the salvation found in Jesus. And it portrayed that for all those hundreds of years before he came in person. Mm. And when he came in person, they didn't recognize who he was, the fulfillment of all those services, uh, which was tragic. But uh, but today he's given us the the blessed understanding uh, of what all that meant and what it still means today. Well, we concluded uh, this week's study on Friday. Uh, we were encouraged to read uh, The Night of Wrestling in Patriarchs and Prophets, a powerful story of Jacob and his experience with God, uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ on his way home to face his brother Esau after many years away. Mm. Uh, and um, what it took for him to have the trust in God to be with him through that experience. And so um, these things portray uh, it the same way that uh, that he is with us through all of these difficult experiences. And the Psalms strengthen our faith in God, who is the never failing refuge for those who entrust their lives into his mighty hands. Amen. We'll do great things for those who trust in him. And the reason why his professed people have no greater strength is that they trust so much to their own wisdom and do not give the Lord an opportunity to reveal his power in their behalf. Um, Jacob certainly learned that, that uh, all of his efforts uh, we're not going to bring reconciliation with his brother Esau. But God stepped in. Yes. And it's possible. And we need to learn that lesson, that he will help mm-hmm. us, his believing children, in every emergency if we'll place our entire confidence in him and faithfully obey him. Amen. That's what he wants. Amen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yet some psalms can pose a serious challenge when we, when what they promise and our current situation do not match. <laughs> yeah. uh, and it doesn't yeah. look like he's doing that for us. But at times like that, that's when we need to really learn to trust him. That's and right. Know that he has not forsaken us. He's still there. And we need to trust what he's doing in our lives. And... Uh, at times, psalms can be used to foster false hopes. Uh, Satan used the psalms to try to uh, tempt Jesus, to jump off the temple and so forth, uh, quoting the psalms, saying, the Lord will be with you. He'll take care of you. Um, the angels will protect you. And Jesus had to say, wait a minute. That's not <laughs> what it's uh, mm-hmm. The psalms also say, you shall not tempt the Lord your God. So the greatest victories to the church of Christ, or to the individual Christian, are not those gained by talent, or education, or wealth, or the favor of men. 
There are those victories gained in the audience chamber with God. When earnest, agonizing faith lays hold upon the mighty arm of power. Mm. So wouldn't it be foolish of us in times of dire distress and difficulty to depend upon ourselves to handle it? Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Oh, when we know where we can go, when we know what it takes to lay hold upon power necessary to deal with it, mm -hmm. why don't we go there? Why don't we go That's there? That's right. Someone who can see it and someone who knows about the problem from all angles, who can see it from every perspective, who has our, who only has good thoughts towards us, our best good, uh, and someone who has, as we said in an earlier day's lesson here, someone who actually can help. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. <laughs> so how can we develop unreserved trust in God in all circumstances? Mainly by understanding who he is and that he yes. has set his love upon us. He has set Thank his you. love upon me. Yeah. Uh, Amen. I will deliver him. I will set him on high. He's known my name. So if he loves us and we love him, we're in great shape. Cause me to hear your loving kindness in the morning, for in you do I trust. Cause me to know the way in which I should walk for. I lift up my soul to you. Teach me to do your will. You're my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me in the land of uprightness. And then Psalm 145, the Lord is near to all who call upon him. Fall upon him in truth. He will fulfill the desire of those who fear him. He also will hear their cry and save them. The Lord preserves all who love him. But all the wicked he will destroy. I prefer to focus on the first half of Psalm 145. 20. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the Lord preserves all who love him. Heavenly yeah. Father. We praise your name and we thank you for that. We thank you that we've been assured today that you are our refuge, that you are watching over us as a mother hen watches over her chicks, that you are in the sanctuary uh, observing our lives and all of our needs, waiting to hear us to call so that you can provide all the help we need May we do so as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Ray, uh, for taking us through this lesson. And friends, as it turns out, you have a few bonus minutes. We were able to uh, uh, complete this lesson in a little less time than normal. Some of our lessons, we are just jammed right up to the time. I think last week was one of those that we went past mm -hmm. time. So, yep. so uh, this week you have a few extra minutes to prepare for the worship service, which will begin here on this channel in just a few minutes. Or welcome to our uh, physical location at 48th and A Street here in Lincoln, Nebraska. We welcome you. We pray that you'll have a wonderful, wonderful Sabbath. And we look forward to lesson five with you next week, which is singing the Lord's song in a strange land. Which you already <laughs> have because I sent it out already. <laughs> which exactly, which we have already. And by the way, if you're not on the mailing list, uh, you can look in the church directory or uh, put something in the chat next week here for me when you log on and we will get, uh, put your email in there or, or text me or some, some kind of way we can do that or call the church office to get Pastor Ray's email so that we can get that lesson out to you. I think it's helpful to kind of go through and uh, you can see what his answers are. Notice my answers aren't always exactly the same. Well, they usually are about the same. I just say them in a lot more words, I think, <laughs> typically. <laughs> <laughs> I like words and that. So anyway, friends, we pray that you'll have a wonderful, wonderful Sabbath and a great week. And we look forward then to uh, meeting with you again next week to uh, do our next lesson study in this uh, wonderful study of Psalms. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.